thanks thanks for the intro chris um so what we're going to do is is take you through the this new product called client side protection um and and make, make sure you understand the problem that it's trying to solve and, and and give you a little rundown on on its capabilities but i think the real power uh, of of what we're going to show you today is is um when lynn is going to actually walk you through a demo and show it in action so you can actually see it um, and, and I think that's, um, that's going to be the, the, the point, the aha moment when you're going to sit there and see, um, you know, what this could do for you. So um, we're going to take you through a little bit of just a small number of slides here before we get to that demo. Um, and just so, uh, you know, just to put it into context, um, uh, you know, under the, the premise that Imperva protects data and all the paths to it, um, this, is, this solution is definitely under that philosophy. Um, and we have, you know, various threats that are coming in from outside the threats, from from automation and bots and 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 hackers trying to get into to the network. And then once they're on the network, it's the different types of, um, uh, you know, access that people try and get and insider threats. And we're dealing with those those issues. And I'm not going to go into obviously each of those. But where does this client side protection fit? Um, and because it's actually sitting in the browser on the person's uh, you know on their actual desktop and and so it's really a client side issue here that's that's being exploited so it's a little bit different from where the WAF might sit or where other solutions that we offer might sit um, because it is actually client side and and people are manipulating the client side code and so that's the area that we're focused on um, and so if I if I go on what what really this is is that it's a blind spot of these JavaScript services. So JavaScript is obviously ubiquitous third party services are deployed on services everywhere. Um, we all probably know them, um, but the, 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 the amount of them on a website might be somewhat surprising to, to people. Um, and so what the typical one that you know is the great example that everybody understands is Google Analytics would be a piece of JavaScript code that was added into your website. And what you do is effectively allow your, you know, that request and that JavaScript to send data to Google to, to give you your Google Analytics. Um, and so that would be um, the process that happens for many, many other services. So you would have marketing automation. So your, your Eloquas, your your Marketos, your HubSpots would be using that. There would be a piece of the JavaScript code. If you have a live chat feature, there's another piece of JavaScript code. And you know, whether you use Zendesk or Olark or whichever service it is. If you process payments, uh, there would probably be a third party service that you do with that. So um, all of these services can be added on. And, and as we did this on the Imperva website, I'll give you, we, we talk about that, you know, websites could have 50 uh, plus JavaScript services. Imperva.com actually had over 90. So uh, it can vary depending on how many services are at, added there. Um, and the problem for the security team is that these services get added by developers or the marketing team. Uh, so their visibility into it is not very clean. They don't know what got added and when it got added and has it been looked at and is it, is it, uh, has it been, um, you know, is it approved and taken care of? And so this blind spot of these JavaScript services is the, the issue that we want to deal with. So um, the, the first thing you've got to think about is do you trust where these JavaScript services are sending their data? Um, and so that's the first thing. And then do you know if any of the JavaScript services have been compromised? So you're, you're, you're accepting that when you actually, you know, copy that code and put it into your website, that it actually works as, as expected and it hasn't been compromised itself. Um, that is what attackers are actually going after. They're seeing that there's a blind spot here in your website and they're launching what, what are called client side attacks. So, um, so what are client side attacks? Let's just go through it so that you, you get a, a good view of what they are. Um, they can sometimes be called form jacking. Um, and that is obviously hijacking of a form on a website. And it's typically the payment form. It could be the login form, but payment form is where you hear about it mostly. Um, and so that any form, any content that is entered into that payment form, that data also gets directed to the attacker's server. 
Uh, and how it's done is that they've compromised the JavaScript, uh, could be in a, in a GitHub um, repository, could be uh, in some other way, they've compromised it. So wherever that JavaScript is posted, um, it's sending that data on, from multiple sites to um, the attacker's server. And, and so that's the issue. It's also known as, as mage cart attacks. You, you, that might be a common name for it because uh, there's a group uh, launching these attacks and they were called the mage cart group. So you might hear about the mage cart group uh, doing attacks or you may call them uh, mage cart attacks. Sometimes it's called payment skimming or digital skimming. And the idea here is that um, in, the, in, in previous times when people compromise an ATM or a, a, a payment process at a gas station, for example, they would put a skimmer into the actual slot where you put your credit card. This is, if, and stealing that credit card information, this is effectively doing that in a digital way and skimming that credit card information. Uh, another term for it would be supply chain attacks. Um, so, you know, there could be JavaScript embedded within JavaScript within services uh, and it's, it's compromised further up the supply chain. Uh, so it might not be the actual payment process that is a service JavaScript service that's been compromised. It might be something that's embedded in that from another service. Uh, so there are sometimes they're referred to as these supply chain attacks. And if you can compromise anyone up that supply chain, um, you might be susceptible to these attacks. Uh, another one is JavaScript skim. So um, all of these would be classified as, as JavaScript attacks, uh, a client-side attacks. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sure that you understood the, the, the basis for what, when you hear about this in, in, the, in the press. Um, and so typically you, you hear about client-side, you hear about MageCard, and the attacks are popular and they are growing and they're getting more and more attention. Um, and there is even government warnings on them. And so I, I just want to make sure that you're uh, you're understanding w where this fits in the landscape when you hear about these um, these these compromises and these attacks that, that are happening. Um, and so let me let me explain a little bit more about what it is and and, and what it does. And, and and as I said, you know, let's talk about the the example that is is the most common that we see is the payment form. Uh, so somebody entering their credit card information into the website, that payment form has been compromised. So that JavaScript uh, code um, that is in there has been compromised in some way. And what it's done is it's sending those third party services, as I said, to whatever it, JavaScript code is in there. And what you've got is authorized connect. You're expecting it in this example here to go to Google, to go to Marketo, Zendesk, and Magento. Um, but what happens if that third party payment processor um, is compromised? And, and what happens is that, it, and the, this is why it's a blind spot, is that the, the, cu the customer who is using your website and putting their credit card in there doesn't actually see anything different. They think that the payment has been processed and they don't see anything that has been, looks, looks odd to them. Um, the customer who is serving up that website also doesn't see anything because they do a, get a payment process. So everything works normally, but what happens in the meantime is that a copy of that data is sent to the attacker. So it's sent to a server elsewhere um, and it completely bypasses any of the, you know, the web application firewall that you might have in place, the API security you might have in place. It's bypassing that because it's going directly from the client side, directly to the attacker service. So all of those other security features are not helping solve this problem because they're seeing that there's a way of exploiting this JavaScript code. So that's why it's important to understand that some of the security solutions that you have in place don't see this kind of attack um, and unless you have a specific client side protection uh, like the one we're talking about from Imperva today. Um, and so when we talk about it, if you think about it, it really is about the data and effectively it's a mini data breach over and over and over again. And because it's a mini data breach, it's not stealing millions of, of, of records, it's just stealing record one at a time every time it's processed through a form. Um, there are compliance problems from any data that's stolen. Um, and so 
I, I put the three options here, the typical ways you should think about the data, but the one in red is the one that I think um, everyone understands and is the one that's far more prevalent uh, than the other two. Uh, that's why I've highlighted it in red. So skimming the payment information um, so it is, the, is the, the use case that is the most dangerous here. Any company that processes the payment with a credit card, what they're looking for is obviously credit card numbers, expiration dates, CVV. So any industry that has a process where they process a credit card um, is, is vulnerable here. It's not just you know, one industry, it's across the board, anyone processing a payment. Uh, and then there's skimming credentials. You can imagine that this is a way of getting inside an account. If I can compromise the login form and steal those credentials, then I can go back and go into that account and compromise whatever may be there in there, you know, whether it's health information or financial information, credit card information, order, order something. Um, so skimming credentials is another use case of doing this. All I need to do is uh, you know, go back into the account after and I know that those credentials will work. Um, and so that's another use case. The third one, which is a bit more involved, but you, you, you can imagine that there is rich information if you can compromise forms on, on government websites, such as you know, driver, where, where people process driver's license or apply for things uh, from, from, from government organizations. They would be putting more PII or social security information into those kinds of forms. So you could build a profile on it. Um, and so it's, that's another way of using this information if you can compromise a website in that way. Uh, but I will, I will say again, just as, as I close out on this, the one on the left, the skimming of payment information is where we have seen the majority of activity in this and that's where you hear about most of the attacks. Um, and so one of the, the biggest attacks that, that was out there was uh, British Airways faced um, a record breaking fine, 230 million uh, under the GDPR for a breach of 500,000 records uh, you, from one of these attacks. So it certainly is getting uh, a certain amount of attention uh, depending on how, um, you know, what, what data is compromised and the compliance issues that uh, are in play. Um, so, so when I sort of look at this and I, I try and I make you understand it, how it fits in the Imperva world, um, like I said, there's a, the client side here. This is where this new product is. The CSP here is uh, the acronym for client side protection. Um, and so that's where it sits in terms of how you should think about it logically. You can see where our cloud WAF is, our advanced bot protection, DDoS, where our WAF gateway is, where our RASP solution would sit, uh, and then deeper into the database where our, our database and DAM, uh, um, our, our DAM products and CD. Yes, place. So you can see that we're way outside on the network here on, you know, on the client side. Um, and that's where this product um, works. Um, you do need the cloud WAF for client side protection to actually uh, function. So the cl you, uh, cloud WAF has to be deployed. Um, that's one thing that I, I think it makes sense for everybody to understand. Um, and what we have is sort of four things that, that, that hey, it Adam. does. Sorry? Edward, a uh, quick question for you, sorry. Yep. Um, how are, let me try to read this question. How attackers will compromise particular application JavaScript, meaning which method will, you, will they use for this? Yeah, so that's, that's where this sort of supply chain attack can happen. They can, they can compromise and get access to sort of where this code is on a GitHub. If there's any sort of open source version of these things, they might be able to compromise those. They might do some phishing attacks on, on the GitHub page. Those are examples of, of types of ways where they go and compromise the code. So you can imagine if you can compromise it in one place and then that code is grabbed by the developer and posted on websites all over the world. They've only got to compromise it once and then suddenly thousands of websites might be vulnerable to it. So, you know, the, 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 the methods by which they would do it, I can imagine there would be, you know, phishing and getting into whatever, you know, that GitHub repository or, or where, wherever that code is, is stored for that company. If they could uh, fish and get into the admin account of that, that's, that could be lucrative way of them deploying one of these. So that's typically the method that we've seen um, this code get compromised. Um, but what we're saying here is we, we have a solution that even if that does get compromised, um, you, you don't suffer from the, um, the, the issues of it because obviously that's not your, your the, the person who deploys this code on their website, they can't 
deal with any protecting of where that code is living and where it's been compromised, they can make sure that it doesn't contact any services that it shouldn't be contacting. And so that's what the, the product is going to show you now when, when I show it to you. Um, okay. That cool. answers the question, but if, if there's anything more, Lynn, that you'd like to add to that? I... Yeah, just um, another example of a way that we've seen the applications actually get compromised is through the S3 buckets. Uh, being used, getting compromised. And in April of 2019, there was, um, I guess you can call it like a campaign where the, uh, one of the mage card groups were automating the process of actually scanning um, to see if there are any misconfigured S3 buckets uh, to see if there's like, um, uh, like uh, the credentials are like available in the in the code or if it just was misconfigured to not actually be protected properly. So they're actually um, like scanning uh, a bunch of different companies S3 buckets to, to see if any of them can be compromised for this use. Um, and you know, that alone is a really good reminder to make sure that the web administrators are reviewing the code and making sure that you know, their S3 buckets and other artifacts are are actually secure and won't cause um, a different attack to occur. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. If there's any, any more, just please jump in, Chris. Is, that, is there anything else? Or? Nothing else, thank you. All right, cool. Um, so in terms of the product, the, the, the first step here is that we discover and give visibility into any third party services on the website. So right now you don't know how many you have. Like I said, in, in our example, Imperva had 90 uh, on our site. So that's a, a, an idea of how many services might be there. So we'll first off, give you that visibility. Then once you have that visibility, we'll kind of give you some reputation information and get you some insights to help you make a security decision about do you want to allow that service to, uh, to, to be able to call out to, to it. Um, and then we have the ability to enforce it. So you can sit there and say, no, we're not going to allow that or we're going to block it. Um, and obviously this all helps with the various compliance requirements of PCA, PCI, GDPR, CCPA, um, that, um, you know, losing data, um, deals with. Um, and so I'm going to go into each one of these just a, a very quickly um, before we go into the demo. Um, but what we have is discovery. So for example, here you can see how many discovered, how many need a review, how many are allowed, how many are blocked. So you have full visibility control over which ones are, are executing and you see any, any ones that pop up and need a review. So that continuous monitoring and that alerting to say, hey, we've got a new one that's been added, you need to look at this. It hasn't been allowed or approved. That is also happening. So for security, there's no longer blind to what, what is executing. They're no longer blind to any new services that have been added by the developers or the marketing team. Um, and then so it also reveals any services that actually do send uh, data and perform some data transfer. Um, and so on the insights, what you see here on the top, and, and Lynn will go through it in, in far more deep depth, is you actually get highlighted what issues that there might be. For example, in the red in the top, you see that it was registered very recently. So if it's registered recently, it might be like, why is this service not, you know, this service has been going for a long time. It should be, you know, registered a while ago. If it's randomly been registered very recently, that's a, a red flag that really you should go and investigate. Is this service really doing what it should be doing? Uh, so it really does sort of give you domain registration dates, validity of the SSL cert, what resources are being requested. Um, so you get that in, insight into the reputation of the service to help you make that decision as to whether you want to allow it or block it. Um, and it, it allows you to go and investigate it further. And, and I think that's the key part is the control is now you actually can see something and go, well, ah, that looks wrong. Let me go and do some further investigation and then you can make that decision. So you're not waiting wasting your time trying to find the service, you've actually got a list of all of the services that are there, you can now go and uh, investigate them. And then that, there's that control. And, and one of the things that obviously is cl uh, clear here, if you, if you look at this, it's, it's a one-click mitigation. It tells you, do you want to allow it? Do you want to block it? Um, does it need a approval? You get alerted. And so you have that control over each individual service. 
uh, whether you want it to be uh, to send the data to where it's going because that's the bit you don't want to happen is sending the data somewhere it shouldn't be going um, so you only want it to be going to Google if it's Google Analytics you don't want it be going somewhere else that's that's the example here um, and so and, and then finally the, the 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 deployment is easy but it, as I said earlier and I just want to make sure that we, we, we made it aware if you have um, it, you have to have the cloud WAF, the cloud application security pr platform, uh, but once you have that, it, it's easy deployment, uh, one-click configuration, there's no changes to your code required, it won't break your website, it works out of the box, and because it's in the cloud WAF, it doesn't add any additional latency. So some of the, those are some of the benefits of, of deploying our solution in tandem with, our, with the cloud WAF that we have. And so that's the overview of the product. I'm going to hand over to Lynn now and, and, and and get uh, get her to take you through through the demo. And so let me, I'll stop sharing. Is there any questions for me before we hand over to Lynn and while we allow her to grab hold of the yes. screen no, Not any specific questions, and maybe this is just out of curiosity uh, for you know people that might not know, is it? And, and maybe it's something Lynn will show, but you know, you mentioned that, you know, Imperva had like 90 uh, JavaScript codes or whatever uh, on the site. and you know, is it as easy as, hey, you turn, if you have the Cloud WAF product, and then you get this product, you turn it on, and then it just kind of scans to see all the JavaScript JavaScript codes, and it tells you what, what they are, or, you know, what does that look like? Or it, maybe that's it, it, it is not something that happens, you know, the moment you switch it on, it's, it's not like a code scanning solution. I, I'm jumping okay. ahead of you there, Lynn, but uh, it, it, <laughs> what it does is, is that it, it over time and as more people use your service so if it's if it's got a, a, a if you're on a popular website it starts to uncover more and more services so uh -huh. um, like it's like we said when we did the the imperva one within 24 hours we had the 90 services identified um, and so it's it's one of those things the more traffic you have the quicker you see services the the less traffic you have the some services may not be uh, be be activated and seen uh, until uh, you know until that somebody actually uses that service so um, that's something that uh, you know I you know I think it but it's pretty immediate coming out it's the process starts but services will be un unveiled the more and more traffic that uses them I, I hope oh. that, that, that yeah that no that's out. No, that's exactly what I was looking for. I, I was just curious more so than anything. So it's pretty cool. All right, Lynn, can I hand over to you? Do you want to start sharing your, your, there you are. I see you're sharing your service. I see your screen. So Lynn, over to you. Thank you, Edward and Chris for that great introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, so to start off the demo, I wanted to show you this website. So this is um, a very simple e-commerce website that we have created for this demo. Uh, you can see uh, at the top, there's like a login page and you know, there's some pictures of images that, uh, of different products that can be purchased. So this is a very simple e-commerce page uh, that can stand in for any of the more complicated um, websites that you all have. On the right hand side, I pull up the network tab in the developer console. So you can see all the different services that are actually running on this um, application. So if I were a user um, and I were to go onto this page, uh, I would see that there's really good deals on iPhones. I would be really excited and um, I would want to log in uh, so I can make my purchase. And for me as a normal user, really nothing looks unusual. I, you know, I mean, the service, the, 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 the UI is a little, you know, lacking, but like nothing really looks suspicious. Um, and also if I were to look at all these services running in the developer console that I can see here, nothing really looks unusual for me. I would really have to investigate each individual one. Um, uh, and that would be very time consuming um, in order to make sure that nothing really stands out um, other than just the initial scan that I'm doing right now. So uh, everything looks good. So I'm going to log in and uh, I'll do Lynn, one, two, three, four. I'll submit and I was able to log in. As a customer, I'm happy and now I can continue my journey to purchase this iPhone. Uh, in reality, what we did is we added one service that is actually skimming the data. 
Um, and for the demo, we made it very obvious. So we made this service called ismage.com that's actually skimming the data. In reality, what these uh, ha hackers are doing is that they are uh, registering and uh, creating domains that look very, very similar to the actual name of the company that they want to attack to make it even more difficult to, um, to figure out. So let's say instead of uh, an L, they would use like an uppercase I, or they would just add like a dev to the end of the domain. They're really trying to, to make it very difficult for the users and for the security team and development team to be able to catch these changes. So what you can see now, if I, uh, this is ismage.com, it's that service. And if you go here, you can see that my username and password has been skimmed and stolen to this external service. And this is exactly what's happening in real life. They are either adding JavaScript services that are skimming the services, or they are compromising an existing service um, that's going to skim the data and hope that they don't get caught. And you can see um, you know, how much analysis you would really need to do in order to catch something like this. So you can see why these attacks can really last for so long. So now what I'll do is I'll hop over to the console so you can see what client-side protection actually looks like. Okay, so this is what the portal looks like. And you can see here that I'm currently pulled up on the website that I just showed you. Um, in order to start discovery, it's really, really quick. All that you would see is one button that says start discovery. And once you press that, uh, this is what you will see. So the website starts off in monitor mode. The purpose of this mode is for Imperva to start injecting the header the, that we are uh, using to actually get visibility. Chris, I see you unmuted yourself. Is there a question? Oh, you're so good. It's so funny. Um, so <laughs> one question is, <laughs> I've read of a mage card attack using script in a Favicon EXIF data. Would the tool pick it up? Uh, would the tool pick up on this? Let me just Favicon EXIF data. I I feel I I I think I'm I'm familiar with this attack. Are you able to give me, um, Stephen, just more information about what they did in the attack, just so I can make sure I'm answering correctly? Uh, so can you hear me there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't have much about this. It's just an article I read uh, in Computer Magazine. I think it's just normal JavaScript that they managed to inject into the same place. Um, obviously, not in the normal JavaScript embedded on the page or in a, a, a scripting program, but in this rather weird place that for some reason the browser decided to run. Um, I was just wondering, having looked at your demo, it looks like you're not doing what I thought you were doing. Um, actually, looking at the JavaScript that's on the page, you're actually looking at the, the requests going in and out. Um, so, my guess is it probably will work. You will pick it up. Yeah, so our tool is able to detect any requests that are being made like to outside this application. So um, really, if, if they compromised um, this script um, and they were trying to um, exfiltrate this data, they would have to send it to an external server like I just showed we were doing with this ismage.com service. So if um, you know, they are actually trying to exfiltrate the data outside of the application, our tool would be able to detect that. Uh, yeah, because what we're really doing is we're looking at the requests that are being made. Um, and that is actually how um, our system gets visibility. Uh, did I answer your question, Stephen? Yeah, that sounds like right. thanks. Perfect. Um, and I will definitely do additional research about that particular attack um, so I can become more, more familiar with it. Um, but actually, that's, that's a very good segue because 
what we are using is we are using um, a native functionality that's available um, and can be used in all modern browsers called the Content Security Policy Header. Um, and using this header actually allows us to have like, uh, we have not seen any latency or any uh, websites breaking, like what can occur when a JavaScript is being used in a solution. Um, what happens is when you go to, when you first uh, start a discovery and you're in monitor mode, we start injecting this content security policy header and that header starts uh, sending reports back to us. So if you guys can see here, um, you can see it says here CSP underscore reports. Those are reports that we are getting about each different request being made from this application to these services. And our system takes all of these reports, parses them out, and uses it to give the user visibility into all the different services that are making these requests. So you can see here, this is really the first portion and very important. Um, it's the visibility to what services are actually being used on your website. So when you start off, um, you start off, uh, you know, you need to review all your different services, and from there, the user can decide if they want to allow or to block these different services for making requests further. And that really um, is the second um, main purpose of the monitor mode. It's to give the user time to actually start analyzing all these different services. And this is really where the second portion of the visibility comes into play. Because like Edward said, we give you visibility into each of the different services so that uh, you don't have to go and do a lot of research either by talking to the development team or doing a lot of research online to try to figure out what are these services actually doing, who do they actually belong to, and if there's anything suspicious. Um, so here you can see some additional information that we give the user. So we give the user like who is the owner of this uh, domain. We let them know what resource types are actually being transferred between application and this service. We also give you a way to uh, sort by the number of IPs that we've seen to help you prioritize which services you should look at first. And here we give you some additional information, some more information about the SSL certificate, if it's valid and who's the holder. Uh, we give you additional information like if we have classified it, uh, that means it's, it's more, uh, a more common one. Here you can see this one does not have a trusted SSL certificate. So uh, this is like a very visual warning for you that something is wrong. Um, here you can see some additional. So this uh, domain has hidden their um, domain owner. That could be an indicator like um, why, why did this uh, service decide to hide it? Um, is that possibly malicious? So really, um, we try to give you as much insights as possible so that you can make as informed of a decision as possible about whether each service should be allowed or not. We also have like filters where you can see you might want to analyze all the ones that are making data requests first. Um, and we also um, give you search functionality to make your uh, analysis process a little easier. Now, if I want to learn more information about ismage.com, I can click The beauty of demos. This happens every time, so no worries. <laughs> yes, I will go talk to the platform team. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so uh, I clicked on view more button for ismage.com and now you can now I can see even more information about uh, the service. So you can see here when this domain was registered. The reason that uh, this insight was added because we've seen in a lot of attacks they're using services that were very recently registered uh, because they're creating uh, domains to use for specific attacks. Like I said, they're actually naming and creating um, each different domain to match the website that they're trying to attack. Uh, 
will give you more information about when this was discovered. So let's say um, if, if we discovered when you first onboarded like 50 different things, and then three months after uh, you have done all of your analysis, you see a new service uh, get discovered, that should be something um, you know, suspicious for you. And you would definitely want to go analyze that, figure out is that something that the development or the marketing team has added, or is that something that a malicious person has added? Uh, like I said earlier, we also give some additional information about like, where is this domain registered? Like, who is the owner? Um, and what resources are being made? We also gave you these quick links um, to a couple services that we know uh, people use often. Uh, so like Virus Total, they aggregate different like scanning services. So you can see if anyone else has caught it. Who is, uh, you know, just gives you information about the register. And Alien Vault, it's another security provider. Uh, we also give you some inf additional information about the IP uh, sources. Uh, what we're going to do is we are planning on connecting this with Imperva's reputation intelligence and let you know if any of these uh, IPs, um, let's say, are considered by malicious by Imperva's reputation intelligence, um, that could be another key for you to possibly investigate this um, a little more deeply. We also give you information about the browsers that are actually making the requests. Um, and these are all parts of the insights that we give you. The insights are really one of the things that the team is investigating the most uh, time and effort right now, because we know that it's really this analysis process that's very time and effort consuming. And we want to make it as easy po as possible for you to understand if a service is malicious or if it's supposed to be there and should be allowed. Right now, we're also working on creating a risk score, utilizing all the different insights that we are collecting. Uh, that's something that should be coming out um, in, hopefully in the next couple months and um, will definitely also help the prioritizing and analysis process much easier. One portion I haven't talked about yet is all of um, the, the table that you see down here. And this is actually a breakdown of the different requests that are being made. Um, so you can see here where in the website is this request being made? What is the file that they're requesting? And here is where they're actually requesting that file from. We also show you the line number. So in case you do have access to the code for the application and you want to do some initial analysis, you can, uh, you know, you can easily see where the code uh, that's referencing this actually lives. And here is a very important piece. So I already talked about how we give you general information about what resource types are being transferred, but here we actually give you information about each different request and what resources are being transferred. So let's say, I knew that for this service, only scripts were supposed to be being transferred. But all of a sudden, I see that data is also being transferred. So that for me would be a big tip off. I would definitely want to go talk to the application team and see, hey, is this actually supposed to be making data transfers all of a sudden or not? And if the application team says, no, they should not be making, then I would definitely want to go and uh, do some additional analysis about this and even block this service. Um, so that's one way that you can use all of these different insights uh, in order to, in order to uh, make decisions, inform decisions about whether services should continue to make requests to your application or not. So now that um, I've decided to block this uh, service, I'm actually going to switch over to block mode. So in monitor mode, the user is able to make all the decisions about these services, but everything is still going to be allowed to make requests. It's only once the user actually goes to block mode for the entire website that the user would, um, all the changes that they made would actually go into effect. So this is letting you know that if we discover new services, they are going to be blocked because we say, okay, you've reviewed all these, 
Um, so anything that you have not reviewed and are going to be new, they're going to be blocked. And what we do is if you have left anything in still needs review, um, before you go to block mode, we, um, we allow these to be blocked because we know that sometimes you want to go to block, but you don't have time to analyze everything. So that's why these are still going to be allowed and then you can make the decisions about them. One thing that I haven't mentioned yet uh, is we also have these uh, notes functionality. Um, and this is uh, a really great way to have an audit trail all in one place. So if multiple people are analyzing these services, uh, you can add, if you find any information from uh, external sources, like if you do go and talk to the development team, um, you can add all information to here and really keep one place where really all information about these JavaScript services can be found. Okay, so now that uh, we have turned this to block, uh, what I'm going to do is go back to the website. And if I refresh, you can see that now the service, so ismage.com, is being blocked. So it's no longer able to make requests. You can see that no other services are being blocked. You can see for the user, the website still looks uh, completely normal. And if I were to log in, so I'll do win one, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, I can still log in as a user. I can still interact with the website completely normally. But now if I go and refresh, you can see that the additional username and password of Lin1 and 12345 do not show here. And that is how client-side detection is able to stop these malicious and compromised services from making um, from skimming the user's data from your website. Uh, one additional uh, thing that I wanted to add, because uh, someone had a, a question about the discovery, we actually just, uh, right before this uh, webinar, uh, we onboarded one of our clients to uh, client-side detection, and uh, literally three minutes after we onboarded them, I pressed refresh, and we've already discovered uh, like 15 or so services. Um, and that was a test site. So you can see that even for test sites, um, our service is able to discover things very quite quickly. Um, and to help you get a better understanding about if discovery is done, we give you this uh, little KPI where when was the last discovered uh, when was the last service discovered? So if you see the last uh, service was discovered like a week ago or two weeks ago, you can say, okay, I think that this service, um, all of my services have been aggregated um, at this point. If, if you, know, you see that uh, you know, it's still today's date or yesterday's date, um, I, I'm guessing that the website was probably recently um, onboarded onto here, and you probably do not want to go to block mode yet. Um, are there any other questions about the demo, the UI, any of the functionality that you see here? As of now, I don't see any questions, but let's see if one or two get asked here shortly. No questions as of yet. So. Okay, so uh, we really just had one. Oh. oh, wait, we do have a question. So, does this use script uh, hashes to detect changes to scripts? So we we don't leverage hashes yet. I I know what you are referring to. That is something that we have on our roadmap um, and we definitely want to add. Uh, but at this point, we, 
we have not implemented that functionality yet. Let's get to know that, that that's at some point coming down the line. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I think you're talking about SRI. Um, so yeah, that is on our roadmap. Uh, can this data uh, be sent over uh, the logs to SI SIM tools? Sorry. So right now we are integrated with attack analytics. Um, that is our first integration. Just this week, my team is starting to implement uh, the SIM integration. So uh, it's definitely, uh, the SIM integration is something that we're going to have very soon. We don't have it right now, but we are actively working on adding that functionality. That's great. So a lot of cool things coming down the road. It might be good to kind of look at in January, maybe to just talk about what's come, you know, and, and maybe February to say, hey, this is what's come now, and this is what we've added, you know, and then later, you know, say, hey, look, this is what's what we think is uh, coming down the road or something like that at some point. 100%. We have a lot of plans for, for this product. Um, yeah, it's exciting. So let me just present this. So client-side protection has already been added to a couple different plans. So some people have already um, had client-side protection um, entitled. Uh, they're already entitled to it. So we just wanted to show you these two different screenshots. So. Uh, if everyone is going to see client side protection, this is what the tab looks like. Um, it's going to have the little new icon next to it. Uh, if you click on it and you see uh, this button where you're able to launch client side protection, that means that your account is already entitled to client side protection and you're able to go and um, onboard your websites to it, which like I said, super easy. It's just one click. Um, and we really have not seen any negative impacts to uh, latency or any website breaking. Um, so we really tried to make that onboarding as quick and possible, quick as possible. Um, if you do not see that button, you're going to see a screen like this where you are able to access a free uh, trial uh, and letting you know to contact your Imperva representative. Um, very soon, we're going to also be adding a button here so you can start a trial for yourself. We don't have that quite yet, but if you don't see this button to launch, you're still able to trial client-side protection uh, by, going to talk, by going to talk to your Imperva uh, representative. Hey, Len, um, is there a way to apply this globally rather than uh, per site basis, kind of like proactively or? Um, right now, it's per website. The reason for that is because we are injecting a header, we wanted to make it like a very active, um, you know, like action that the user actually has to do in order, uh, you know, to confirm that they do want to inject this header. Um, if we do hear that people want to uh, turn on client-side protection just to onboard, like, you know, five, 10, 15, multiple websites at once, that is definitely something that uh, we can uh, look into. Uh, technically, I don't see any problems for it. But right now, it does need to be one by one. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, you know, some of our guys or someone get a GitHub tool, you know, go to GitHub and maybe create something that can do that. I've seen that on some of the stuff on uh, Cloud WAF. So I don't know. Um, yeah, if I hear more, I'll definitely send them uh, your way on that. Thank you. Um, and that really is the the demo that we had for client side protection. Awesome. Anything else uh, from Edward, or are we just just to make sure that? Uh, no, I, I think I think one of the things just to reiterate there on the on the the sim conversation is that. Um, Currently, it is integrated into attack analytics, so you can see this information directly on that dashboard. Um, so that's a, a, a key part of the integration that we've, we've already done. And obviously, to other SIM tools, those things are going to be uh, on the roadmap. Cool. 
Um, and their free trial period, you know, what does that mean? How long is it? You know, uh, how can they do it right now? I know there's not a, a button there, so. So out of the box, the trial is 30 days, uh, but your uh, Imperva representative can extend it for as long as needed. Yeah, and Rakesh, if you need to know who that is, send me an email uh, directly, and then I'll, I'll find that person for you, or if you know who they are, just reach out to them directly.